A very warm welcome to Misha Glenny, uh, known uh, to many of you here um, for uh, his pioneering work over, well, over, I would say, starting the 90s, so we're, we're, heading, we're heading to three decades now um, of uh, really top-class reporting, first working for The Guardian, then the BBC, where, as many of you know, his stomping grounds uh, initially were very much Central Europe through the end of the Cold War, uh, and Misha wrote a series of books during that period um, uh, which uh, really uh, cemented his reputation um, as one of the great investigative journalists but also observers um, of periods of deep transition and change. Um, and uh, his uh, books and his reporting of that period, in particular on the Yugoslavian wars, the Balkans, uh, won the Sony Gold Award, uh, uh, I think it was in 1994, around that period where he wrote, uh, as I said, a series of books. Now since then, uh, he has morphed more into, if I can put it this way, Misha, the Misha we know now, um, which is the Misha Glenny associated with the dark side of the world, I'm afraid. Um, well, I'm going to say I'm afraid. I think for you this has proved to be um, uh, an important seam of work to be able to explore, but also a critical one for you uh, and people like you who focus on it to raise awareness about. Um, and uh, from uh, the book that he wrote on Dark Market, um, which was in 2011 to his latest book, uh, Nemesis, One Man and the Battle for Rio, which came out in 2015, looking at Brazilian drug trafficking. All of these, in a way, have flowed out of that book for which you are now um, uh, forever known, uh, McMafia, uh, which you wrote back in 2008, 10 years ago. So, um, uh, uh, you know, publishers must be delighted in getting this yeah. second, uh, second wind uh, on this opportunity and really made you uh, a world authority on organized crime. Um, and we are going to be discussing today uh, the issue of global organized crime but specifically in the context of the revolution of the drugs economy. And we've gone pretty broad with a number of subjects that we've covered in the plenary sessions here uh, since yesterday, but we thought it would be worth having a plenary session where we went a little deeper um, into one particular manifestation um, of uh, global organized crime and its interconnection inter uh, here with the massive global scourge, and I think we're going to hear from Misha in a minute the extent to which it is global and therefore particularly suited to this conference, the global surge um, of, uh, of that world. Now, back in 2008, Misha, you predicted that organized crime would likely account for 15% of global GDP, and that was excluding well, that was, narcotics were blended into that particular uh, uh, total figure, but I think it would be a great place to start would just be to give everyone here, and give me, a sense of the scale of this market, this economy um, uh, that, that drugs currently represent in all their forms. Where are we at, if I could start with that? Uh, well, uh, we, can start with, um, we can start with a couple of stats. Um, uh, the market, global market in heroin and cocaine is now estimated to be about twice the size for the market in an industry like cyber security, um, which has been growing at a phenomenal rate over the past 10 years, but it's still dwarfed by the heroin and cocaine markets. But I think for me, the most striking stat that I'd like to introduce this with is that between the years 2012 and 2016, 353,500 people were killed in Syria as a consequence of the war. During exactly that same period, 348,400 people were killed by other human beings in Brazil alone. And uh, about 60% of those deaths are directly ascribed to the consequences of the war on drugs. Nobody talks about Brazil in terms of a civil war, and yet the rate of killing is comparable to Syria. And I have got to a stage of complete despair about this. How much blood do we have to have on our hands before we start reassessing a policy introduced 100 years ago, the war on drugs, which has failed by every single criterion that it has set out uh, to meet in the most spectacular fashion. But what I want to talk about today, Robin, what we're going to, to chat about is actually 
through a variety of circumstances, that is now shifting. There are uh, three really major changes going on in the global drugs economy, which people really need to be aware of because they will have an impact both on individual countries but also on uh, geopolitics around the world. And if you were to uh, sort of you said you've this three, so you've, you've laid, set these up for us. I mean, I think from my point of view, one of the most interesting dynamics is the way that it appears to be adapting at the moment to, uh, uh, to the way the global economy works. And uh, it seems that a number of the countries around the world, I mean, there's a few sort of pioneers out there, um, Canada comes to mind, that are trying to adapt themselves in the way they've responded to this, this incredible spread and the fact that in a way, uh, uh, the global drugs trade has become and is a truly globalized operation. How do local governments, how do national governments manage what is in essence a, a truly global uh, uh, part of the economy? Well, um, you mentioned Canada and this is actually a, a watershed moment that we're about to see in the autumn. That is the legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes across uh, all provinces in Canada. It is a federal law. This is the first time that anything like this has, uh, has happened. Uh, the marijuana industry in Canada is already uh, huge. It's estimated to be about 0.2% of uh, Canadian GDP. Um, and in anticipation of the legalization, one very interesting thing that is happening is, is that uh, pension funds, hedge funds, banks, um, uh, uh, angel investors and, and so on are becoming obsessed by this trade and they're mm. investing a lot of, of money into it. Now it's going to be uh, regulated in a different way from province to province. The provinces decide how it will be sold, how it will be grown and so on and so forth. But this actually points to a very interesting thing about uh, why marijuana is being legalized in Canada progressively in the United States and in Europe probably the most uh, progressive country in terms of drug law reform is Switzerland and this is because they are all federations and local government has considerable power. It started in Canada with British Columbia and Vancouver because so much of the economy, uh, particularly in rural areas in eastern BC, was dependent on marijuana. It's estimated to be uh, valued about 40% of the town of Nelson in eastern BC, for example, and no mayor in Nelson is going to move against Canada. They actually have municipal jurisdiction, which means the RCMA, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, don't have jurisdiction inside these local towns. So this built up as a localized movement, which then spread across the various states, and then it combined with Trudeau becoming Prime Minister to ensure that it would be federal legislation. But if we look down in the south, this is going to be very, very, this is going to have a huge impact on the United States, exactly. where we're already seeing state by state legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes. One very interesting point was that when Trump came in and appointed Jeff Sessions, Sessions said that he would be deploying federal law because marijuana is still illegal for recreation, recreational purposes uh, <coughs> uh, under federal law. He would be deploying federal law against California. I note that he hasn't done that. And I suspect that there is a huge reluctance on the Trump, so the part of the Trump administration to do that because California is now at the forefront of states' rights against federal rights in the United States, which is a fascinating flip from what it used to be. It always used to be the southern states who wanted to treat their minorities badly, railing against federal law. It's now, fed it's now liberal states yeah. who are challenging the federation, and they're doing it first and foremost through drug policy. One uh, statistic which is worth bearing in mind is Colorado, which is uh, had marijuana legalized for the past three and a half years or so. Last year, they uh, derived in taxes from the marijuana trade $120 million, which was over twice what they received from taxes on alcohol. And this is hypothecated into the health and education 
services. And once states acquire that particular addiction of tax revenue, yep. then I think you'll find that there's no going back on the legalization of marijuana across the United States. So an uh, interesting connection and link up point actually to the last panel, which I think you and I were just listening to the tail end of this idea that, as Nari Wood said at the end, and a number of other people noted as well, uh, local federal government may be the level at which real change can start to happen in some of these really intractable problems. And certainly, uh, the those of us who live here in the UK uh, have heard that you know, the re or the resurrection of the debate about legalization of marijuana in particular, um, but also the case being made, why is all that tax money you know, going to the drug lords? Why should this not be applied, for example, to the NHS uh, and other issues? But as author of Darknet, um, even my understanding of the drugs trade is that this has been changing from the, the kind of traditional trade that could be taxed in traditional ways because it's bought over the counter and a packet of cigarettes with a health warning and a certain amount of money goes to the treasury and a certain amount of money goes the other way. But the big phenomenon of drugs trade recently has been its move online. Um, and so is there not a risk that as they make this adjustment or as people make the case of the tax revenue, actually people go for the cheaper drugs and maybe cheaper drugs are online than having to buy it in a shop. It kind of destroys, the, you know, isn't this a danger? Um, well, I mean, you could say the same thing about uh, alcohol. Amazon yeah. sells alcohol. Berry Brothers sells alcohol. Uh, they still pay their taxes quite happily over the, over the internet. What it requires, of course, is a carefully thought out regulatory framework. So what people like me argue for is for drug law reform, regulation, putting uh, issues of health and social stability at the forefront, yep. um, built in to any form of incremental decriminalization and then legalization. And that includes working out things like uh, tax revenues. Uh, it also includes things like, I mean, when, uh, when we sell alcohol here, we're only allowed to sell it uh, at 40 percent proof, for example. We can't distill right, right, right. it at a higher concentration than that. And on the whole, people don't do it. Now, one of the arguments that's often used about marijuana is, is that the skunk that mm. people smoke today is much, much stronger than it was uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, <clears throat> I have to say now that um, people didn't experiment quite as vigorously as some people I know did yeah. in the 60s and 70s, because <laughs> believe you me, there was stuff that was strong uh, <laughs> then as well. It was slightly more difficult to hold, get hold of, that's true. But the point is, is, is that you have now several generations of people who smoke marijuana. Yep. Um, and if you were to be able to introduce it into the new generation of, of consumer so that their expectations were of something that made them feel happy, made them feel good, making sure that, you know, if they're caught with it in their, if they're caught under the influence driving and things like that, then you pretty much lock them up and throw away the key. But that there are there are ways there are ways of regulating this just as there are ways of regulating uh, other substances whether prescribed or not well and on prescribed let me ask let me get one more question to you then i really want to bring people in so do have your comments or questions ready to, to raise with Michel on any of these points, and I'm sure he's happy to go a little broader as well than, than the specific target. But uh, you were talking there about marijuana. Start with marijuana, work out how legalization could be done in such a way, as you said, that you kind of learn the process of taxation, licensing, regulation, etc. America has been afflicted in particular by the opioid crisis. Yeah. I mean, this is well known uh, uh, generally. And you know, this, this has always skirted the line of uh, legal uh, uh, sedatives, legal forms of painkiller, uh, and combine themselves with all sorts of online forms of distribution. What gives you the confidence that the, somehow the dark side of the drug trade is, is going to be able to be fully uh, suppressed in this kind of environment that you're describing. What does the opioid crisis in America tell us about the kind of model that you're laying out for Well, <clears throat> I don't yet have the perfect model to solve these problems, but I think there are two things that I, uh, I feel are very important to point out. First of all, we've had the war on drugs for a hundred years. There have never been, there has never been an epidemic sowing death 
uh, with such facility as there is now in the United States. I mean, there have never been any uh, number of uh, number of deaths as uh, 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 like as what we're seeing now with the opioid crisis. It's a, it's about 60,000 a year. It's the same number of homicides in Brazil. And the United States is now confronted with a real drug problem as opposed to one which has largely been sort of fictionalized and fantasized over the past hundred years. So it has to deal with that. This drug problem was caused, caused primarily by the profit seeking of big Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies who in the 1990s started pushing synthetic opioids like Oxycontin and Vicodin through the privatized US uh, health service and they created a uh, a lot of people who were addicted to prescription drugs who can no longer access those prescriptions, so they're buying off the dark net. And what they're buying chiefly now is heroin laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid which is produced in large numbers in China, smuggled into Canada and the United States and uh, 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 killing a lot, of, uh, a lot of people. Now that goes on to the second point, which is the nature of distribution, as you hint, is changing. It's going over to the dark net. What that means is, is you're seeing a change in consumer habits as well. So here in the United Kingdom, the top seller on the dark net, and the dark net is now worth about 25% of the drugs trade in the UK, the top seller is not marijuana or cocaine, it's MDMA, ecstasy. And the capital of ecstasy in Europe is North Brabant in Holland, where 90% of MDMA is produced and distributed throughout Europe. Law enforcement does not have the resources. It was fine if it was in Afghanistan or Colombia where the stuff was being produced and you were only getting people in faraway countries of which we know nothing being killed in large numbers. But now law enforcement is having to deal not just with the consumption of drugs in Europe or the United States, but with the production and the primary distribution as well and particularly in an era of austerity and the need to train up highly specialized law enforcement agents who uh, have the facility to work in cyber and things like that, law enforcement just isn't keeping up with this. And it, uh, I, so I've spent a lot of the last year going around university cities interviewing people who consume drugs off the dark net. And I tell you, go to somewhere like Manchester or Glasgow or, or Sussex and this is just a huge open market. Nobody feels threatened by law enforcement, mm. but they're not just buying MDMA, coke, uh, heroin, and, uh, uh, and marijuana. They are buying Xanax, they are buying ketamine, they are buying all sorts of things, and this is an entirely unregulated market, and the parents of these children have no idea what they're putting in their bodies, and the children have no access to any proper testing facilities. Uh, so we are, we are playing with people's lives now by, by continuing this policy of prohibition. So, so ultimately, right, so exactly, ultimately, one's going to have to move the regulatory approach, in your opinion, through pretty much the whole spectrum of... You, of I, 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 unfortunately, you do. And learn as you go along. Right, well, look, it's a th you know, this is the case. Let's get some points from, uh, from all of you. I'll draw as many in as I can at a time, take them back. Uh, we can run a few mo moments over uh, the, the prescribed times. We started late. So um, I saw two hands go up at the back. Okay, one, two there, and I'll bring others in. There's one on the side, yep. I had the gravy from Open Society, uh, which as you know for many years has um, been promoting the idea of legalization. I'm curious about the political dynamics of this, Misha. You pointed out that tax revenue can be a hugely important incentive for local government in particular. Um, does it also work on the law enforcement um, uh, cost-benefit ratio as well? So I have colleagues who work on the harm reduction program of OSF, for example, who constantly make the argument about uh, it's just much lower cost to police a regulated market with, of legal substances than, than the other, other way around. But first of all, does that really work for all drugs? Is it possible? Marijuana legalization is pretty uncontroversial these days, but you know, what about some of the other substances that you're talking about, particularly particularly the opioids. Um, and secondly, does the cost-benefit ratio, is it possible to explain that in ways that make sense um, in terms of national elections, that the local police force
workforce can spend its time better, um, that there are, there are better ways of, of doing this. There, there still seems to be it, not even a moral argument, but just a blockage in the political dynamics of, of explaining that point. Yeah. Okay, just pass the microphone back. I'll keep track of these. Mimi Anchipati, thank you for your remarks. I, I wondered, um, first of all, uh, how many, do you know what the effect is, is on a, 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 a city like London? And have you managed to link your research to the exponential increase in, in rough sleepers, young rough sleepers, say for London, that's because I live in London, you see that all around, and, and maybe around the, the UK and the rest of the world. Thank you. Yeah, this, I suppose that phenomenon, we've had a little bit of um, these shots of, you know, the people completely out of it, appearing a lot on the news, uh, much more phenomenon in seats these days. There's one more question here and one there, and then we'll, I'll bring it back to you and keep it the floor. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a Chivna Scholar from um, Bristol, and my question is that we know uh, drug economy is not good, but it's not a traditional kind of, uh, of crime. You can't solve it with traditional method. Um, I want to know that in countries like Philippines, they are taking some very strong methods to deal with the drug dealing, but at the same time, they are criticized about that kind of methods they are uh, violation of human rights or lack of leg uh, le le legitimacy or things like that. So, well, what's yeah. your comment about such things? It's a good contrast point. Of the, let's call it the, yeah, the Duterte method versus the legalization method might be one way of having it as a shorthand. Let me just take one more here and then I'll, I'll come over, I'll come there in a second. Yeah. A, a point and a question. The point is interesting that in Colorado, now that it is legal, supply has exceeded demand and prices are crashing. Um, the question is how much is law enforcement, in, certainly in America, invested and receiving vast amounts of money and have a vested interest in keeping everything illegal? Keeping everything, exactly. But uh, to mm. what extent, yeah, no. you always end up building bureaucracies, if you see what I'm saying, that, that end up then uh, needing to fight the fight. Let's just take those, because there's a number of points there, yes. I'm going to lose track of them all. I'll, uh, I've exactly, got them I'll, if you've got them noted yeah. down, that's great. Heather, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, your point, well, marijuana legalization is, is, is not yet uh, um, entirely uncontroversial because you know we heard it restated against he again here by by the government. Um, I often wonder. I was thinking of uh, uh, approaching Nicola Sturgeon and saying, uh, "Why don't you uh, go ahead and legalise for Scotland and see how that would put things in the mix?" And of course, Scotland could do with the uh, the tax revenue associated with the marijuana trade. There, it was a very very healthy trade. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, the first thing I'd say is, is it's good to start with marijuana, it's good to start with somewhere like Colorado. Colorado's been doing it now for quite a long time. Has Western civilization as we know it broken down in Colorado? The answer is no, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an important, an important point to make. Just in terms, I'll combine these two questions about uh, what the gentleman was uh, saying about law enforcement's vested interest in uh, drugs remaining illegal. Um, there's no question about it that in the United States, much of the criminal justice system is built upon the revenues derived from people busted for marijuana. And of course, those people busted are 80% from minorities. It's uh, entirely disproportionate, this. <coughs> And this actually also refers to the uh, the issue of um, uh, people on the on the uh, on the streets as well. Um, the uh, transition of the market from the street to the net is one that is being exploited primarily by middle class young middle class people who have the facility with the internet and who have. Uh, access to safe houses where the drugs can be uh, sent to and also they have access to the internet and they know how to use Tor and VPNs and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas if you look at our cities, 
It is people generally from deprived backgrounds who are still buying on the streets and it's not just a question of, of sleeping rough and the impact of drugs like spice and, and K2, which are synthetic, uh, basically synthetic cannabis, which, uh, which are much more damaging than, than organic cannabis. Um, it's also to do, uh, there's also the issue of violence. If you look at the issue of the violence in London at the moment, which for the first time uh, uh, since records began has exceeded, you've exceeded the number of homicides through knife crime and guns in London um, uh, compared to New York this year for the first time, for the first time ever. Much of this is to do with um, the, uh, the turf wars that uh, uh, gangs distributing drugs uh, are uh, disputing. So uh, all these things are linked together. The United States has, a, has an exceptional situation because of the uh, hyper-privatization of the criminal justice system and in particular what's known as Lockup City, which is the second largest city in the United States after New York, and that is people who are incarcerated. Um, uh, when I was investigating the criminal justice system in the United States, it had terrifying echoes to me of the Russian criminal justice system, that once you get caught under its wheels, and particularly if you're male, aged between 16 and 28, uh, black, unemployed, you will never get out of it. Mm. So. Um what about the strong methods question? I mean, because as an international conversation, it can feel a little bit like this is a, a Western, you know, Canada, West Coast, Colorado, London. Yep. Right, there are other so countries here's the, that take here's, really here's the different paradox. approaches. The, the war on drugs has been driven from Washington for 100 years. The UNODC is the only UN agency which, the, which Washington pays up on time every year without fail and uh, it has always worked closely with the European, whether it's an Italian or a Russian, interestingly enough. Uh, Washington and Moscow very much concur on the, on the war on drugs. Mm. Um, and so it's, the policy has been driven internationally from Washington, but now what you're seeing is with um, all of the issues that, that we've been discussing up until now, we're seeing shifts either in uh, advanced democracies or in South America and Central America because the Central and South Americans are saying we have had enough of sacrificing hundreds of thousands of people a year for your policy so you're seeing change all over Central and, and South America uh, but in places like China in places like uh, uh, Russia um, uh, Indonesia Iran which uh, a few people know, has the highest incidence of heroin addiction in the world. Um, uh, you are continuing with a very hard line of the war on drugs, the Philippines notably with Duterte, uh, but they are all beginning to struggle. China has a very serious growing heroin problem, particularly uh, in the south, and it doesn't really know what to do with it. At the moment, they're still in that sort of gut reaction of we've just got to prosecute, 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 but they too will come up against the problem of resources at some stage. And, and just if I can piggyback on that quickly, on criminal networks, to what extent I mean, again, this has traditionally been run. All the movies that, including some that came out earlier this year about the 70s and 80s, the big uh, uh, drug running cartels from, from Latin America, um, maybe some of the, the connections through to Afghanistan. I mean, try, is, this, is there an Asian phenomenon? There's a global economy here. If the Asian economy is growing globally, I presume the drugs economy is growing there as well. Is this what's yes, happening there are two, some of the gangs? The, there are there? two fundamental sources of narcotics in. Uh, in Asia. The first is uh, Afghanistan, although uh, heroin is coming back um, in parts of uh, Myanmar as well. But the other thing is the methamphetamines production in East Asia, which is huge. A lot of that comes out of North Korea. Um, Japan is a big consumer of amphetamines. And then what you have seen uh, uh, around Southeast Asia o over the past 10 to 15 years is a very significant growth in places like Indonesia and Malaysia which previously had no heroin culture. It now has a big heroin culture as does southern China and to an extent Shanghai as well.
Okay, um, let's get some other points in. I've got one question here, two over there, one over there. I'm sorry, oh, exactly, I'll get to you. Yep, sorry. Thank you. Um, my name is Ochitl Barranco, I'm a Shevening scholar, and I'm from Mexico, so this is quite <laughs> an interesting topic for me. Um, in terms of drug cartels, as uh, sorry, Dr. Robin was elaborating, I wanted to ask you if we should consider or if we should actually be talking more about how are we going to hold accountable governments, European governments and the US governments, because yes, Latin American countries and Asian countries are exporting drugs and because there's an offer, but there's a demand, sorry, um, but what happens with this drug, sorry, with this arm trade and with this gun trafficking that comes from European countries such as Germany exporting guns to the states and these states coming to Mexico and ending up in the hands of drug cartel lords. So the connection with the, the arms trade in essence and, and all of that violence. Interesting Germany, I, I knew about the US, but um, yeah, sorry, the gentleman there who was waiting for before. Yeah, hello, uh, Tim Shariwa, University of Oxford, and I wanted to know, um, because you spend a lot of time in Brazil, in Rocinha, for um, the research for your novel, whether, uh, book uh, rather, whether you had been back at all in recent years and what your personal impression of the deterioration in Brazil is and what would be coping strategies or regulative measures to combat um, the resurgence of a drug economy in, in the developing world or in development contexts. Great, so better, those two questions there. Yep, one, two, yep. Uh, specific to the issue in Afghanistan, my understanding is that it's a country with, because of the infrastructure, the opium is the best thing it can produce. And one of the big problems is we can't sell, they can't sell it into the legitimate medical uh, usages because there's laws about synthetics. Is that still going on? And thanks for any comment. Please pass the microphone there, yeah, Tim. Um, <coughs> Tim Wilsey from the <coughs> Chatham House Council. Uh, loved your book on uh, the Balkans, by the way, um, Misha. Um, so when decriminalization happens and um, the profits from the crime are removed, what then happens to these sort of brutal, well-armed, venal, well-paid <laughs> criminals, you know, all over the world? I mean, they don't become care workers. What, what, what do they do? <laughs> Well, well, let's take, yes, and I said I'd take one more here because I've got to keep eye on time a little bit. Yeah, I've got them all listed. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a Chivening Scholar uh, from Afghanistan, so th there has been a lot of discussion about Afghanistan. Uh, I have some statistics with me, and it's <laughs> despite that the uh, government has created a dedicated ministry uh, to fight uh, this uh, uh, opium problem, opium economy in Afghanistan. Uh, so the last 10 years, it's on the rise. The UN ODC has put millions of dollars into, into this area, but it's, uh, it's still on the rise, and it's now equivalent to 16% of the country's GDP. How much percent? 16%. percent one six. One six. yes, of the country's GDP. Uh, and the, the problem is, yes, it's exporting the opiums, and it's like 90% of the illicit global opium is produced in Afghanistan, but the problem of the uh, domestic drug addicts is also on the rise. Yeah. Uh, so th the question is if, and there was a discussion in the political sphere, especially by the current president, uh, of legalizing this opium uh, production and cultivation. But the problem is if you legalize that, given the fragile law enforcement sector uh, in Afghanistan, there is another problem. Mm -hmm. If you leave it open, uh, uh, unregulated and unlegalized and combated and prohibited, then it's yeah. not working. So I, I want to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, and and yes. that last point, which is very interesting, let me just stop there because there's a lot of questions to take up. And, and there was a discussion in the last session, which you may have missed at the beginning, Misha, mm. about uh, the way in which if you want to be a good kleptocratic government, one of the first things you do is you make sure you control law enforcement. Um, people mention ministries of defense as well, but you can then use them in a way to, to take your own rent from what may be a, then a regulated system, which may give a little bit to the question over there. So where do you want to start I, I, I on that? I think yeah. it, it, it relates first and foremost to the issue of Mexico, um, <clears throat> because ever since uh, former President Calderon uh, be, uh, uh, basically uh, militarized uh, the war in Mexico, you have seen a proliferation of people involved in law enforcement and even the military uh, becoming involved in the drugs trade. 
Um, and uh, along with that, I mean, what, what happens in Mexico, what happens in Brazil, is, is that because the profits from trafficking drugs are so astronomical, uh, it means that those people engaged in trafficking of drugs can afford weapons that challenge the, the state's monopoly on violence. And that's why what you're looking at throughout Afghanistan, Central, South America, is you actually are looking at a civil war because you are looking at groups of people who have sufficient firepower to challenge the authority of the state and create spaces which they govern which they are autonomously uh, governed. If you look at Mexico, we really do have one of the most hideous examples of all, where weapons from the United States come down into northern Mexico in exchange for cocaine uh, going north, and it is this sort of satanic cycle um, that, the, that the war on drugs combined with America's gun culture has created. I'd actually say that Latin America is an entirely uh, unresponsible for this because um, uh, Brazil is the fourth biggest small arms producer in the world and a lot of weapons in the Brazilian wars uh, are actually produced in, in Brazil, it, uh, Brazil itself. Uh, so uh, there is, of course, a Western responsibility for this, but there is, a, there is historically a blindness in Western capitals uh, that we really have anything to do with the fact that Mexicans are being killed, most of them innocent civilians, in, in huge numbers, particularly over the past 10 to 12 years. Uh, with respect to Brazil, I was there uh, six weeks ago uh, in Rio and in Hosinia. Um, the president, Michel Temer, has, had recently deployed the military in Rio solely in order to, in order to cover up the fact that uh, he had failed to uh, push through his reform in the pension system. Um, uh, this is, uh, the military cannot deal with situations in the slums, with favelas. If you're actually going to have a policing strategy to try and reduce the amounts of drugs in circulation, it has to be an, uh, an intelligence run policing operation and not going in with, with tanks and, and heavy weaponry. That is, uh, so, uh, that is failing. I have to say that uh, Brazil is on the verge of a catastrophe at the moment, and this is not about just about public security. It's about the political situation, it's about the economic situation, it's about the fact that uh, there is a genuine fascist uh, who is attracting a lot of votes, particularly amongst uh, young people. There is a growing sentiment for the restoration of, uh, of uh, some form of military, military rule. Um, but drugs and security are always at the heart of, uh, heart of, uh, of uh, the larger uh, politics in, uh, in Brazil. In terms of, I can't remember. Yeah, the, the last one. What you know, after we've we've led, legislated and decriminalised all these drugs, what happens to the criminals? Yeah, what happens to the criminals? Well, of course, what you have to do uh, is you have to plan for this, just as when you have. Uh, for example, uh, the peace process in Northern Ireland, you have to make sure that those people who were members of the Irish Republican Army or the loyalist paramilitaries and <clears throat> who largely sustained themselves, by the way, through the trade in drugs, that you have jobs for them to go to. Go, to, go to. It's like any peace process. You have a lot of men with too much testosterone running around with AK-47s and you have to find things for them to do. Um, because what, is, what has happened in places like Mexico and Brazil is, is that instead of corrupt governments, you have corrupt cartels who are creating their own governance in these areas. And uh, I mean, the, the, the problem for countries like Mexico and Brazil is, is you're not only dealing with the issue of the cartels, you're dealing with the issue of, of governance as well and corruption in particular. Look, um, I have this feeling we've, we've got a couple more questions gone, but we've taken a bunch of questions there. We are, we've taken our full 10 minutes up of starting late as well. And uh, I want to give an opportunity, we've got a lot of a big program coming up today. So what I'm going to ask people to do is you will, I'm, 
think uh, Misha doesn't have to run away straight away. I'm sure we'd be happy to take a couple of questions if you ply him with a cup of coffee on the terrace. Hopefully we're going to the terrace for our coffee. Yeah. Um, let me, I think we better, let's stop there because I think once we start unpacking even more issues, we'll f you've given a great taste, Misha, um, both of uh, the scale of the challenge, but what I'm particularly grateful for is you've come here with a thought through approach of what to do about it. And it's not just based on you dipping into this, this is based on uh, m many years of experience, A, of watching how governments don't work, how they collapse all your time in Central Eastern Europe there, uh, but having traveled wildly, uh, wi wildly maybe as well, <laughs> as widely, um, <laughs> probably, probably true. Um, yeah, that, <laughs> um, uh, you know, you're able to bring some really interesting comparative perspective, and that's part of the character of this conference is to be really be able to compare experiences and ideally best practices from around the world. So, for giving us those insights, and for those, you know, you can track back through all of the books of Misha because they all seem to be current at the moment. Hopefully, not the Balkans um, again too soon. But uh, big hand for Misha Glenny, and we'll carry on speaking and Thank seeing you. later. Thank you.